it's the massacre. We broke with thick like tiger fur. No, you are more like all of us. Please say what you asking for. Round lake, blob life. Hot to us back and we all have wives. Hey, I'm MC Way, not getting vague. And I made in the sea, life is great. Spec go through for days and days. Working around so cold, they freezing. Lemon ice is in the season. We run this camp, so catch me wheezing. All the fun in the sun. Better pick up your laser gun. Round lake, junior high. You know how to never die. Tub is back for another week. Even though our last year broke our five year streak, we gon' keep it hundred. We won't stay in our seats. Junior high camp is on fleek, on fleek, on fleek. Our tub is back for another week. Even though our last year broke our five year streak, we gon' keep it hundred. We won't stay in our seats. Junior high camp is on fleek, on fleek, on fleek. Our tub is back for another week. Even though our last year broke our five year streak, we gon' keep it hundred. We won't stay in our seats. Junior high camp is on fleek, on fleek, on fleek. Morning, guys. Um, it is me, Matt. I am on my couch in my home. Uh, and I am coming to you so we can worship together and learn a little bit about what God says uh, when we have questions when we have doubts um, I know that's weird that like we're inside and you're watching this on a screen and you're not like at wake um, but keep your heads up I mean I know it, I know it's weird I know it's uncomfortable it's weird for me to be sitting here in front of a camera um, honestly I just um, I've been worshiping all week. I've been praying all week. I've been, uh, you know, writing the sermon, and I'm really, really, really excited to to continue and to finish this Doubt It series. Um, and I miss you guys. So uh, this week coming up, we're gonna do a thing called Zoom, uh, and that's just a, a link you can follow. I'll send it to you in GroupMe and on Twitter and all that stuff. Basically, what we're gonna do is we're all gonna get together virtually. Uh, we're going to play some games, we're going to have some fun, um, just to not be too socially distant, but to be physically distant, um, just to keep us safe, to be wise in this time of un, un, like when we're unsure of stuff. Um, so, yeah, um, so that's what we're doing, and we're having fun on Zoom. Uh, honestly, guys, still sign up for camp, sign up for Round Leg. We, we don't know if it's gonna keep going. We don't know how this is gonna turn out. And you know what, that's crazy because we just happen to be talking about what happens when we have questions with God. What happens when our questions don't get answered, right? Uh, we don't know when this virus is gonna be done. We don't know, as it stands now, if we're gonna have camp, if we're gonna have CIY, if we're gonna have VBS for you guys to volunteer at. We don't know. Now, we're assuming we're gonna have it, but we don't know. And sometimes when we don't know, the best thing we can do is trust God. And I know that's hard. Trusting God is not easy if you're not accustomed to it. Trusting God is difficult. Trusting in something you can't see. But you know what? You don't know the pilot of your plane when you get on there and you are able to relax. You don't know the driver of your Uber and you can relax. Most times, you don't. the first day of your school, you don't know your teacher. And you pretty much relaxed. You know that they have what's best for you in life. So with that on our hearts, let's talk about or let's sing about our Creator, our Father, our God, our Rock. We can always hold on to Him in times of trouble, in times of pain, in times of sadness, in times when we don't know what's going on, when we are doubting it, when we are questioning it. We have Jesus, we have that hope for it as an anchor for our soul, as it says in Hebrews. So let's sing about that. When the ground beneath 
My feet keeps way and I hear the sound of crashing waves. All my world is washing out to sea. I'm hidden safe in the God who never moves, holding fast to the promise of your truth. You are holding tight and still to me.
sometimes it's hard to really trust God in these times. Sometimes it's hard to ask Him to lead us so that we can trust Him. Sometimes it's hard for us to ask Him to take us deeper, to know Him more. That's exactly what we're going to do right now. Let's sing. Sing your call. You called me out upon the waters, the great unknown, the female fair. And there I find you in the midst, in the oceans deep, my faith will stand. I will call upon your name and keep my eyes above the waves. The notions arise, I'm so arrested in your embrace. I am yours, and you are. Take me. 
so much for the community that we have, whether we're in person or we're online, that we can co come to a place where we can freely worship you, where we can really ask ourselves the questions, do we believe what we're seeing? Where we can push ourselves to believe the words that we're saying. God, I pray that every person watching this would have an open heart for what you're about to say through me and my message. God, I pray that every kid, every adult, whoever sees this, will just know that they are loved by you. And you desperately want them to feel your peace and your comfort and your joy. And that you are our rock. That you will never move. That you are strong that we can rely on you in these uncertain times. God, I pray that we have courage to ask questions and maybe not get an answer, to, to ask questions and not get the answer that we have in mind. God, I pray that we have the steadfastness to keep pursuing you even when we don't feel like you're there. But even when we don't see it, we know you're working. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. So these last few weeks, we've been on our series called Doubt. Uh, it's actually called Doubt It. Um, but uh, it's all about doubt and questions. And the first week, we learned that you're not alone in your questions. Okay, There's been plenty of people that have questions. I've had questions. Uh, anyone that you've ever met who you follow uh, on anything, Twitter, Instagram, whatever, they've had questions about everything, and particularly God. Everyone's had questions. Um, you know, I related it to a first date. When you're on a first date with somebody, some of you junior hires maybe aren't there yet, but you will be, you ask questions pretty much the whole time. Uh, you want to get to know somebody. So it's not bad. And that brings us to week two where God doesn't shame us for our questions. We talked about Gideon uh, saying like, hey, uh, we, I, need, I need answers, man. I need you to do this, this, and this before I believe. Uh, and, and that's okay. God doesn't shame us for that. We talked about Thomas being like, I, until I like see him and put my hand through the hole in his hand, I will not believe. And you know, he gets a bad rap for that, for doubting Thomas. But you know what? A lot of times that's what we, that's how we perceive our relationship with God. But sometimes we have to see things before we believe in them. 
you know, and then, uh, and that's, that's okay. People need evidence sometimes. There are different types of people. We talked about that. Um, last week we talked about how sometimes we don't get an answer at all. And sometimes we get, don't get the answer we want. And we talked a lot about Job, uh, and Job's struggle and, you know, how he was redeemed through that. Even though he lost everything, he was redeemed through that, and he God used that in his new, improved life. And that stuff didn't go away. The pain of losing his family, the pain of losing everything he owned, that didn't go away. That served as something to remember what God brought him through. Okay, and this week we'll continue to talk about the subjects of doubt and the subject of questions. Um, and for to start, I just want to ask you a question. I know it's weird. This is going to be like a little bit like a Dora Explorer type sermon sometimes, all right? Uh, so I'm going to ask a question. I'm going to wait patiently for you to answer. And when I pretend that you've answered, <laughs> I'm going to keep talking. So first question, do you know the future? No, you don't know the future, right? You probably have a bunch of future questions like, where am I going to go to college? What am I going to major in? What am I going to be? Who am I going to marry? What's my life going to be like in 10 years? Am I going to drive a Tesla or am I going to drive a Ford? Like, these are questions that you probably have. And another question is probably, what does God want me to do with my life? And what's crazy is, what if you make the wrong decision? And that's what haunted me when I was younger. What if I make the wrong decision? And how do you figure out where God might be leading you? So when I was 22, okay, I'm 22, I'm done with my internship at this beautiful, amazing church with awesome people uh, down in Kentucky, and I'm looking for jobs, okay? Uh, and one comes across my desk, really, it's an email from a guy named Jim Borton, you guys might know him, uh, who was like, hey, we're going to be looking for a youth minister soon, please fill out this questionnaire, uh, just feel free to, like, contact us. And I was like, all right, it's Luke's dad, Luke's my best friend, Joel's one of my best friends, so I'm kind of like, okay, I'll do that. It's the only church I applied to in Ohio. Um, and so I, I came down to two churches, this one and another one. And the other one I loved so much. And I, I loved the kids there. I loved the people there. I loved my job there when I was there. But uh, the job that they were offering me was different. So what I had to do is I had to ask someone who was wise. I had to ask someone. I had questions. I had doubts about my future. Do I want to move to where it's colder when every church I applied to is south? Because I'm... I like being warm. I like being near water. Uh, I always say, like, as long as, dude, it can be hot and it can be, you know, muggy, but as long as there's a body of water that I can jump into, I'll be fine. And that's what my entire outlook was at this point. Uh, so I asked my friend Andrew, um, and he and I went through, I mean, we sat there eating kielbasa sausage, <laughs> waiting, and just, and just thinking and praying, and he made me write a pros and cons list of each one. Um, and I did that and we prayed and there were some red flags and I just decided, you know what? I think I know what I'm going to do. And it wasn't easy and I definitely needed help. Okay. And there's a story we're going to talk about, uh, about a girl who she was in a situation much more dire than mine where it wasn't easy and she needed help. So this is the story of Esther. Now, before the story of Esther begins, you need to know a few things. There was a powerful king of Persia named Xerxes, okay? Xerxes did not love God. He did not worship God, but there were people in his kingdom, Jews, who did love God, okay? Um, so one day, Xerxes got really drunk and really angry at his wife. Bad combination. Queen Vashti was her name, and uh, he got mad at her because she refused to strip down and walk in front of uh, all his like friends and high rulers uh, to show off her body. Okay, to impress those people. So because she said no, he was like, you know what? I'm done with you and kicked her out of the kingdom. And then he decided, I am going to wed, I'm going to search the kingdom and wed the most beautiful girl I can find, regardless of if she likes me or not. Okay, so why don't we start Esther chapter 2. Um, I'm just going to sum it up for you guys. So this orphan Jew, Esther, her parents died. She's living with her cousin named Mordecai. Okay, uh, Esther gets one year basically of, stra of spa treatments. Okay, she gets in this like awesome life. She gets picked by the king to partake in this like contest basically, this beauty pageant. She gets a year of spa treatments, a year of training of how to be the queen and stuff like that. Um, and, and she wins this beauty pageant. And to, she gets to wed the king. And you know what? The king is still a jerk. 
but she's living a fairy tale right now. She doesn't really care. She's in a Disney movie. She's like, oh my god, I got picked by the, queen, the king to be the queen. This is awesome. Well, enter the villain, Haman. Okay? Haman is the king's second in command. And this guy wants to wipe out all the Jews in Persia. Like murder them, genocide. Okay? Um, if you've been in history class, you know that this has happened since then as well. Okay? Something of this variance. Esther's cousin Mordecai warns her of the plot to kill the Jews and begs her to appeal to the king, to appeal to the crown and say, like, hey, don't do this. And Esther uh, can't. So the king is not taking calls. The king is just like, nope. And here's the thing about the king. If you are not called into his royal room, his royal like palace, his court, and you walk in and interrupt stuff, you die, unless he reaches out with his scepter. And even the queen, I mean, the last queen said no to him one time, and he kicked her out. Of the, he kicked her out. So Esther is like, mm, I don't know. But then Mordecai says, you know what? You're a Jew. So sooner or later, either you're going to watch the destruction of your people, and then then they don't find out, or you're going to watch the destruction of your people, and then it's going to be um, very clear to them that you're a Jew too, and you die. And he says this, perhaps, Esther, this is the moment for which you were created. Another translation says, perhaps this is the reason for your newfound royalty. Maybe you can make a difference. So Esther tells her people and her maidens, she says, I'm going to fast for three days. Okay, I'm going to fast, my maidens will fast, meaning like her servants will fast, okay, um, and you guys fast, and I will, and then I will talk to the king. And then she says this iconic statement, and Esther 4.16 uh, ends with this, it says, if I die, I die. Now there's a lot of dumb college spring break kids out there saying like, oh, whatever dude, coronavirus bro, whatever, like I'm here dude, if I die, I die. They don't mean that. Trust me, if they end up contracting this virus and they're in a hospital room and they die alone, quarantined without their family, they are going to be so scared up to that point. Esther looks at this situation where she'll most certainly die. Like 99%. And she says, you know what? If I die, I die. If I die, I die. Now that's way more dire than my situation. If I choose the wrong church, I worship God somewhere else. Like, that's, that's different. She says, if I die, if I do this, if I talk to the king and he kills me, then at least I did something. If I tr fail, well then I fail, but at least I gave you something. Right? And God, here's the weird thing. God is never once mentioned in this story. Not once in the entire book. The only thing that we can kind of see God in is when she fasts. When, when she fasts, that doesn't mean God was absent from the situation. In fact, it means that he was working closely. Oftentimes when we don't feel God, we don't see God, we don't hear God, it's because he's so close to us that he's whispering. And I'm guessing Esther probably went to God when she prayed. That's what fasting was back in the day, fast and prayer. So I'm sure she went to God when she was deciding what to do. But all we know for sure is that she sought the advice. All we know for sure is that she sought the advice of a godly person. And that was Mordecai. And here's another guy. We've talked about him before because he is my favorite guy next to Jesus probably in the entire Bible. And this dude's name is Elijah. Okay, so in this part we're going to read, he has just done the whole showdown thing with the prophets of Baal where he slaughtered them all in the Kishon Valley. Okay, then he outruns Ahab, who's on a chariot, and it says, it says that God girded his loins, which I just imagine God like hitting his like quads with like crazy serum that makes him run super fast. I don't know, God was probably just like, hey, run fast. Um, but he outruns this dude six miles, okay? And here's where you pick up. I'll read it for you. Okay? When Ahab got home, he told Jezebel what Elijah had done and that he had slaughtered the prophets of Baal. 
So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah. May the gods also kill me by this time tomorrow. I have failed to take your life like those whom you killed. And Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. Then he went on alone into the desert, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. He said, I've had enough, Lord. Take my life, for I'm no better than my ancestors. What does that sound like? Like If you were here last week, that sounds like Job, right? God, just kill me. Everything sucks. Now, this guy just came off of a huge win. This is like Tom Brady winning the Super Bowl and then being like, man, I just got home and I'm really scared because someone's mad that I won the Super Bowl. I'm going to go hide. Like, that's literally the whole thing. But we know that sometimes in our greatest moments is when Satan and fear can creep in the most because we let our guard down. We get so like hyped and pumped up about what we're doing that Satan can creep in. So he continues and he said, I lay down or he lay down and slept under the broom tree. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, get up. Eat. Get up. He looked around and saw some bread baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He didn't put that there. The angel of God. God provided this bread and water for him. Okay? So he ate and drank and lay down again. Sounds like me on quarantine. Eat, drink, lay down. Then the angel of the Lord came again and touched him and said, Get up. Eat some food. There's a long journey ahead of you. Okay? Now, when he got up, he ate and he drank, and the food gave him enough strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. There he came to a cave where he spent the night. But the Lord said to him, What are you doing, Elijah? What are you doing here? Dude, I was just in, like, I just showed you my power. I just showed you how great I was. What are you doing running away? Why? And Elijah says, I have zealously, which means like radically, with my whole heart, served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you. They've torn down your altars and killed every one of your prophets. I am the last one. And now they're trying to kill me too. So he's scared. Yeah, he destroyed all these worshipers of Baal. He destroyed all these false prophets. And now he's the last prophet of God. And you know what? He's terrified. Because he, they th he thinks he's going to get killed. God says, go out and stand before me on the mountain. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by. And a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast. The rocks were torn loose. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was the sound of a gentle whisper. Remember what I said, he whispers because he's close. And he says this. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And God said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Why are you here? And Elijah replied again, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I alone am left. And now they want to kill me. And the Lord told him, go back the way you came, travel to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive there, anoint Hazael, the king of Aram. Then anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, to be king of Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel Mahola, to replace you as my prophet. Anyone who escapes from Hazael will be killed by Jehu, and those who escape Jehu will be killed by Elisha. Yet I will preserve 7,000 others in Israel who have never bowed to Baal or kissed him. Okay? So, Elijah just performed this miracle. Okay? He had just performed a miracle to show how powerful God was. But right after it happened, his life was, was threatened. 
So Elijah panicked. He ran away and he hid in a cave. And God was like, what are you doing? Why can't you just believe I'm with you? Didn't you just see what just happened? I just lit a fire on a completely soaked altar. You just killed 450 prophets of Baal. You just ran six miles faster than horses. And you're scared because you're the last one of my people? You're still one of my people. And guys, in this time with this virus and being quarantined, we are still God's people. God will still provide for us. So I'm going to read 13 through 18 to you again. When Elijah heard this voice, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And a voice said, what are you doing here? And he replied again, they want to kill me. I've served you forever and they want to kill me. And then the, God gives him all these instructions, okay? He says to go here and anoint this person, go here and anoint this person. Anyone who defies these people will die and there will be 7,000 people left to worship me that have never bowed down to anything else. Even though Elijah had been comforted by God directly, God knew Elijah needed other godly people to help him carry on. So he sent him to go see other godly people. He sent him to go see these people and gave him 7,000 other godly people to help him carry on. Godly people can help us with our questions. Godly people can help us with our doubts. That's the whole point of both these stories. Both of these people, Esther and Elijah, went to someone who knew God, who could comfort them and knew you are God's child. And God has never failed you before and he won't start now. See, God knows sometimes that even though we can see him working, we have this general revelation. When I look outside and see the trees and the sunset, I can see that God is there. But even though I have that, I still need people. God knows and he understands that godly people help us in our relationship with him. Godly people help us with our questions. Scripture never promises that God will directly tell us what to do next. Never. But the stories of Esther and Elijah show us that we need godly people to help us figure things out. We have to have that community. Now, when I finally made that decision, when I finally looked at the, the pro and con list that Andrew and I made, and I finally like prayed my, my last prayer about this, of like, okay, what should I do? I wrote in my journal, I remember... Um, and I actually posted it on Instagram like a year ago with a picture of all of us in Arizona. Um, and I, I said, a direct quote from myself is, uh, I have decided to go wherever I can serve God. And no matter where I'm serving God, I'll be happy. And that's what I decided for my life. If I'm serving God, no matter what capacity and no matter where in this world, I will be happy. And the person who helped me make that decision was Andrew, my mentor. I call him my brother. The person who helped me do that sat with me and ate kielbasa sausage. <laughs> it sounds as weird as it is. And we walked through this journey together. Where should I go? And he said to me, you know what? You're great at leading worship. And that's the opportunity I had at this other church. But your heart, you were born, you were made to be a youth minister. So I ended up making this decision to move to a town called New Philadelphia, Ohio, that I've been to 10 or 12 times with my best friends, and I fell in love with, and here I am now. I am your youth minister. Because somebody in my life helped me see what God wanted for me clearly. And what God wanted for me clearly was to go take a risk and trust him, to go away from what I'm used to and trust him, for, for me to really take this job and make it my life. And to know that I'm still God's child, that he will never let me down. We don't just need one friend, though. 
I didn't just have Andrew. That's just my story. I had tons of friends. I had friends telling me to take another job. I had friends telling me not to do this, not to do that, and to definitely do this. I had a friend in um, um, South Carolina that was like, hey, you could work here at this church on the beach. And, you know, I, I wanted that. But as I prayed and prayed and prayed and sought people through the months that it took for me to find what God really had in store for me, the wife that God had in store for me, the life that God had in store for me, the students that God had in store for me, the church that God had in store for me, the community that God had in store for me, the uh, total love that God had here for me. It wasn't from just my decision. It was because when I had questions, I was guided by people. See, we don't just need one friend. We need community. We need a network of people. And I'd say it would be wise to have at least these seven types of people in your life. So if you're taking notes or if you want to take notes, here's a good part. You need a cheerleader, all right? Who do you go to when you need a dose of encouragement and positivity? Who can you always trust to give you a pep talk? That is your cheerleader. You need a counselor, okay? A counselor is someone who always gives you great advice. When you're in a dilemma, you have questions, or don't know how to move forward, who can you trust to take a next step? For me, that was Andrew. I was in a dilemma. I didn't know how to move forward, but I trusted him to help me take a next step. You need a coach. A coach is the person who can always motivate you to keep making progress on your goals. Okay? You need a mentor. Who is an older person that has an ongoing relationship with you? Who makes you better and who makes you trust God enough to share details of your life with this person, okay? Um, who is that for you? Uh, you need a pastor. That's the next one. Maybe this person has the official title of pastor, or maybe they don't. But it's someone who is guiding and advising you in your faith and helping you develop a deeper relationship with God. You need a confidant. Who would you trust with your deepest secrets? This should be someone who's safe, trusted, and wise. And the last, and I think the most important one, is your prayer support. And this could be one person or a group of people who you can always trust to pray for you. And guys, these people can take on multiple roles and stuff like that. Like, Andrew was more of a counselor, mentor, and pastor for me. And a prayer support. I would not be here if he had not prayed with me over Kielbasa Sausage about being in where I am now, five years later. These people will help you get answers that you seek. You can be one of these people for your friends, and you can help them know God more too. Like, it's not just about you, okay? Your friends need to know God too. So who can you be? Can you be a cheerleader? Can you be a counselor? Can you be a coach? Can you be a mentor? Can you be a pastor? Can you be a confidant? And can you be their prayer support? These people won't guarantee we'll always make the right decision when it comes to God leading us. But you know what? They'll at least make good decisions easier to make. For me, the right decision was serving God always, no matter where I am. Don't be afraid of your questions. You know, we're allowed to worry. We're allowed to fear. We're allowed to have these questions as long because they force us to know God better. When you have questions, you have to ask God. And guys, the only, only reason that we're even able to love God and able to question that is because he loved us first. That he created us and he knew that we were going to sin and he knew that we were sick and he knew that we needed a way out and he provided that way out and his name is Jesus. And we remember that through communion. We remember that through taking of his bread and his body. So we are going to do that today. So if you have anything around you, maybe like some, I don't know, what do I have? I have a water bottle and some bagels. That's how I'm going to take communion today. We can love God because we were given life by Jesus who saw us and said, you know what? Someday you're going you're gonna to know my love for you and I'm going to make you whole and I'm going to make you clean and I'm going to make you free. And that's why 
He went to the cross. That's why he died. That's why he rose again. So we could be forgiven. So we could have these questions. So that we may have a tight relationship like this with Jesus, with God. Don't be afraid of your questions. We have covered a lot of things in this series. Like how having doubts and questions is normal because you're not alone in your questions. God doesn't shame us for our questions, but he gives us the evidence we need in order to believe, especially when life gets painful and disappointing like Job and our questions don't always get answered, but he is with us in the midst of it. And when we're questioning or doubting where God is leading us, we're questioning or doubting what we're, what we're meant for, God knows godly people can help us with our questions and gives us a support system to help us. And as we close this series, the main thing I want you to take away from this is that you don't have to be afraid of your questions or your doubts because God can handle those. Jesus died so that you can have those. That you feel safe to voice your questions and doubts here in Wake. That you can talk to somebody here or with at least one person you trust and that when you have a question or a doubt you need to process, I hope you know that we love you. And we are always here for you. And we're able to be here for you because of our love for Jesus Christ. And we're able to love Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ died for our sins. And we love because he first loved us. So I'm going to play a song. You guys go ahead and grab whatever it is that you have communion for. Or for communion. Guys, I know that this... Uh, this is weird, okay? I know that there are times when I've stumbled across my words. It's not going to be polished and perfect every week. It's just like in Wake. But guys, I feel like I'm with you. And I know that's weird. But you are so loved by myself, by our adult leaders, by our church. And if you have questions, if you have doubts, this still works. We're not that far away. Text, call, FaceTime, Snapchat, GroupMe, Instagram, whatever. I'm here. I'm willing. Emily is willing. Chip and Missy and Mark and Maddie are all willing, Ryan and Michelle are willing to be one of those seven people that you need. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the stories that we heard today. I thank you that uh, even in the midst of all the chaos that's going on in our world, we can still come together and watch a sermon that hopefully leads us to know more about you. God, I thank you for showing who you are in these stories we read today, even though you weren't even mentioned in one of them. I thank you for, for not showing up in the fire and not showing up in the, in the wind and not showing up in the earthquake, but showing up as that still, small voice. And God, I pray that we would focus on that. That we would take this time to just listen to this song. That we would take this time to just listen to what you're trying to say to us. God, thank you for your son dying for our sins and resurrecting again. I know we're sick. We know we're sick. We know there's nothing we can do to make ourselves better. And the only thing we can do is accept you as our Lord and Savior, God, and to follow you with our whole heart. And in the midst of all this craziness outside, I pray that we would open our hearts even further to you this week. It's in your son's name I pray. Amen.
a grace when my heart is undefined Another way when the walls are closing in When I look at the space between where I used to be Cross that bears no burden. Another die for me. There is another in the fire.
Cause I know that's where you'll be I'll count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be I'll count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be I'll count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be Is another in the fire in this lockdown this is another thing to trust God with so I'm going to sing this part one more time and I hope you sing with me at home Joy come every battle, cause I know that's where you'll be. There is another in the fire standing next to me. I'll be another in the water, holding back the sea. Should I ever need reminding? How can you been to me? Count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be I count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be Have a good week